This is episode 21, and today we are finally in the very last scene of Hamlet. That's right, act five, scene two. This is where everything comes to a head, and a lot of stuff happens in this scene. In fact, this scene can be divided into three parts. But before we go into that, we should announce our line for the day, and it's right there on the title slide. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Say it again with me now. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And one more time. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Now, as I was saying, this scene can be divided into three parts. In the first part, Hamlet is speaking with Horatio and tying up a bit of a loose end by describing in detail what happened on the ship bound for England with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Hamlet describes how one night at sea, he snuck into the cabin of his two old school chums, feeling his way in the dark, located the sealed letter from King Claudius that they were bearing, and took it into his own room. When Hamlet opened it and read it, he was shocked, shocked, to find out it was an order to the King of England from Claudius to chop Hamlet's head off on the spot. So Hamlet, thinking quickly, grabbed another piece of parchment and using his best handwriting, wrote out another order as if it were from King Claudius. Only in this new and improved letter, it is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern who are to get whacked by the King of England instead of Hamlet. In all of this, Hamlet felt as though he were being guided by some type of divine force. And this is what he says about it. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. It's a bit of a famous line, and I wanted to give it its own slide here in this presentation. Fortune had even provided that Hamlet had managed to bring along the signet ring that belonged to his dead father, the former king. And he uses this to seal up the new order as if it came directly from Claudius and had not been tampered with. The next day was the fight with the pirates, where Hamlet escaped from the ship bound for England and from which he returned to Denmark. Horatio observes that it won't be long before Claudius hears from England that they followed his command to execute Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Then the jig will be up for Hamlet. Here's what Horatio says. It must be shortly known to him, Claudius, from England, i.e. the king of England, what is the issue of the business there, i.e. that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern ended up on the chopping block instead of Hamlet. Hamlet says it will be short. In other words, this period of time before Claudius knows what happened. Then Hamlet says, the interim's mine. Hamlet recognizes that the time that exists right then and before it is that Claudius finds out what happened in England, that is his time. That is his space in which to move and seek and exact his vengeance on Claudius. Because now, not only has Claudius killed Hamlet's dad, he's also tried to kill Hamlet. Hamlet feels himself very justified at this point in seeking revenge on Claudius. In the second part of the scene, a messenger comes from the king to offer Hamlet a challenge to a duel with Laertes. The messenger's name is Osric, by the way. He's not an important figure in the play, but he will end up being the referee in the dueling match. So we may as well mention it here. But it's not a serious duel. Nobody's going to get hurt, for goodness sakes, at least not according to this proposal that Osric brings from the king. The bet is simple. Hamlet stands to lose nothing. The bet isn't with Hamlet. The bet is between Claudius and Laertes. Claudius has put up six horses against six swords that are put up by Laertes. Osric says, the king, sir, addressing Hamlet, hath wagered with him, Laertes, six Barbary horses, against the which he, Laertes, has impawned, as I take it, six French rapiers. But the bet is about Hamlet specifically whether Hamlet can beat Laertes at a match of fencing. Claudius even gives Hamlet good odds because everyone knows Laertes is the greatest swordsman in Denmark, having trained under the finest masters 
in France. Osric says, the king, sir, addressing Hamlet, hath laid, sir, that in a dozen passes between yourself and him, Laertes, he shall not exceed you three hits. He hath laid on twelve for nine, and it would come to immediate trial if your lordship would vouchsafe the answer. Now, what I understand from these odds is that in a fencing match between Hamlet and Laertes, in order for Hamlet to win, he has to win only three of the bouts. Laertes, on the other hand, in order to win, has to win nine of the 12 bouts. Hamlet, only three. But that's because everybody knows Laertes is such a fabulous swordsman. That's why Hamlet gets the better odds. Hamlet, of course, agrees to the match, as Claudius knew he would. But Horatio is not optimistic that Hamlet will win. Horatio says, you will lose, my lord. But Hamlet says, I do not think so. Since he went into France, since Laertes went into France, I have been in continual practice. I shall win at the odds. What? Hamlet has been in continual practice at fencing? Well, this is the first we have heard about it, but suddenly this whole fencing match between Hamlet and Laertes sounds a lot more interesting. Maybe Hamlet will win after all. But Hamlet has a strange feeling in his heart that he can't quite identify, a feeling of foreboding, a feeling of danger, a feeling of doom. Horatio tells him that if Hamlet has any second thoughts whatsoever about this fencing match, Horatio will go right now and cancel the match, which is supposed to begin shortly. Hamlet tells Horatio not to call off the match, likening his foreboding feelings to fortune-telling or augury. Hamlet says, not a wit, not a wit will you call off this match, Horatio. We defy augury or fortune-telling. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. So suddenly Hamlet's feelings turn to those of his own mortality and that perhaps his life may not extend much longer beyond this point. He can't say exactly why, but he has this feeling. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. And then speaking about death itself, he says, if it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. And now we move into the third part of this final scene of Hamlet, the fencing match between Hamlet and Laertes. Though Hamlet has vague concerns about the match, he knows nothing about the elaborate murder scheme hatched up by Claudius, which Laertes is going to help him with. Laertes and Hamlet begin perusing the different foils brought out by Osric, who will also be the referee of the match. They are making their choice of swords. While Hamlet is busy looking for a foil that suits him, Laertes finds and picks out his prearranged foil, the one that is sharp and pointy on the end and has also been dipped in poison. Claudius is ready with the goblet of wine and puts a pearl, or union as it is called, into it, declaring that the winner of the first round will drink down the wine and take the pearl as a prize. He says, set me the stoops of wine upon that table. If Hamlet give the first or second hit or quit in answer of the third exchange, let all the battlements their ordnance fire will set off all the cannons in the castle. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath. And in the cup, a union or an union, the pearl, shall he throw, richer than that which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn. So this is a pretty valuable pearl. Hamlet and Laertes then commence the first round of the match. And lo and behold, Hamlet wins. Even though Laertes is fencing with a sharp and poisoned sword, he can't even put a scratch on Hamlet. And Claudius is right there with the wine. He says, stay, which means wait, give me drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Here's to thy health. And then the stage directions say, he drinks and then drops the pearl in the cup. See, the poison is somehow on the pearl itself. Then the drum, the trumpets, and the shot from the cannons. And the king says, give him the cup. And Hamlet says, I'll play this bout first. Set it by a while. Dang it, 
Hamlet is too into this whole fencing match to drink the poisoned wine. This must be so frustrating for Claudius. So Claudius puts the cup of wine aside for a moment and continues to watch them fence. Incredibly, Hamlet wins the second bout as well. Laertes can't even touch him. Hamlet's mother, the queen, is so thrilled with her son that she picks up the cup of poisoned wine, not knowing it's poisoned, of course, makes a toast to Hamlet, and drinks it down. The queen says, The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet. And there the word carouses means toasts. She's toasting him. She lifts the cup. Hamlet says, Good madam. And the king, who knows it's poison, says, Gertrude, do not drink. But the queen says, I will, my lord, I pray you, pardon me. And she drinks. The king says in an aside to the audience, it is the poison cup. It is too late. But the poison, though deadly, is not immediate. And at this point, only Claudius and Laertes know that Queen Gertrude has just downed about a pint of poison. What really makes this sad is if Claudius actually loved Gertrude, which it appears he did. I mean, look at everything he did to get her. So he's probably really upset at this point that he just accidentally gave his wife poison. But while the poison is secretly stripping away the stomach lining of the queen, the boys are playing their third round of fencing. Laertes still can't get the point of his poison sword to scratch Hamlet. So he slashes at him during a break in the fencing when Hamlet isn't looking. Now, not only is this bad form on Laertes' part, Hamlet now knows Laertes' sword is sharp in violation of the rules because Hamlet can see he is bleeding. Hamlet begins fencing with Laertes, only this time for reals. Hamlet manages to switch swords with Laertes. So now it is Hamlet who has the sharp and poison sword. And with it, Hamlet now wounds Laertes with the poison tip. At this point, the poison is working its way through the queen's system, and she faints to the ground. Hamlet says, how does the queen? And the king says, trying to find a cover story, she swoons to see them bleed. The queen says, no, no, the drink, the drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink. I am poisoned. And she dies. Hamlet says, oh, villainy. Ho, let the doors be locked. Treachery, seek it out. And now Laertes, himself dying because he has been poisoned, decides to blab the whole plan out loud to Hamlet. He says, it is here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour's life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. The foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo. Here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poisoned. I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. So, Hamlet's a walking dead man. Laertes won't be getting up anytime soon. The queen is dead, or shortly will be, and the person who caused it all is sitting there on his throne, looking a bit too healthy for Hamlet's taste. Hamlet says, The point envenomed to, then venom to thy work. And he stabs the king, but he doesn't kill him at this point. And everybody in the crowd is going crazy. Hamlet's just stabbed the king, and they start yelling, treason, treason. The king says, oh, yet defend me, friends. I am but hurt. Hamlet says, here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this poison. Is thy union here, or is the pearl here? Then he forces him to drink the poison. Hamlet forces Claudius to drink the poison from his own cup. And then he says, follow my mother. And the king, Claudius, dies. Hamlet has finally achieved his revenge, but at what a cost, both to himself and to those he loves. Laertes asks Hamlet for forgiveness, and Hamlet gives it. Then Laertes dies. Hamlet is not long for this world and gives his final speech to Horatio, telling him that nobody will understand what Hamlet has done here this day or why, because frankly, it does look pretty bad. And he charges Horatio 
with the task of explaining it all so people will understand. Hamlet says, I am dead, Horatio. Wretched queen, adieu. You that look pale and tremble at this chance, addressing the crowd, that are but mutes or audience to this act. Had I but time, as this fell sergeant, and fell there is cruel, as this fell sergeant death is strict in his arrest, oh, I could tell you, but let it be. Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest. Report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Then Hamlet's last words are, the rest is silence. And finally, we come to the line of the day, which Horatio says over Hamlet's body. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Say it with me again, won't you? Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And third time pays for all. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And there's your ball game. We have now gone through the entire play of Hamlet, and it only took us 21 episodes to do it. I have really enjoyed working on this project, trying my best to make Shakespeare fun and easy for everyone. I hope you have enjoyed it too. Now that we have gone through Hamlet from beginning to end, I plan to do a few more shows about Hamlet from different perspectives, which I think will be fun. Foremost among these will be condensing the plot of Hamlet down to five minutes. Now, that will be a challenge. Another will be a review of all the lines we have memorized while going through Hamlet. And finally, I am considering a trivia show about Hamlet to see how much you can remember from what we have covered. Well, that's about all for tonight. Please remember to hit like and also hit subscribe. Also, leave a comment below as to your thoughts and ideas. Also, leave a comment as to which Shakespeare play you want me to cover next. I am thinking since Hamlet was so heavy, maybe we should turn to something lighter. A comedy, perhaps. And if you would be so kind as to donate to this program, please go to brushupyourshakespeare.org. That's brushupyourshakespeare.org org and click the donate button. If you can make a monthly donation of $5, that is great. If you can donate 10 or $20 a month, so much the better, whatever you can afford. Your contributions and donations keep Brush Up Your Shakespeare coming to you on a regular basis. And please join me next time for another episode of Brush Up Your Shakespeare. Good night, all. <laughs>